Okay, so let's let's get going. Okay, so thank you, Gina, for telling us about how the climate of Mars has changed over time because this has a huge impact on whether life ever existed on Mars. I'm gonna talk about how we use Rover to understand um, past or present potential for life on Mars. We can't talk about Rovers without talking about the amazing landing of Perseverance a week or two ago. Um, and this was the first time we had video beaming uh, back to us from the surface of Mars. And it was just, it was amazing. But uh, Perseverance is hardly the first rover that we've sent to Mars. Um, there are showing is the, are the locations of all the rovers and the landers we've ever sent, starting with Viking uh, in 1976. Perseverance, Curiosity, which is the rover I work on, and Insight are active today. So when we search, say search for life on Mars, there are usually two strategies. One is life detection. So in, that involves looking for biosignatures. And the other one is habitability, which consists of understanding whether the conditions for life ever existed. Um, here's a bunch of biosignatures. They come in many forms. And usually we're looking for an assemblage of them. Um, generally, they fall into either chemical biosignatures or physical biosignatures like structures and textures. And then a little more about habitability. Um, this includes looking for the elemental building blocks, um, energy sources for life, and a liquid solvent, most usually water, uh, also involves temperatures and pressures. Um, we have three rovers and three tool sets right now we're focusing on. So Curiosity, which landed about 10 years ago, Perseverance, which just landed, and ExoMars, which will la uh, launch in 2022. Uh, Curiosity was the first to go beyond the follow the water uh, that the previous smaller rovers did to follow organics and bioelements such as carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur. And the payload was designed for this purpose. So the payload uh, it was the most capable payload ever to land at the time. It was it's two tons, the size of a Mini Cooper. It required the design of the sky crane to land. It has cameras and drills to collect rock samples and put them in the belly of the rover where the analytical lab is. And the, the main part of the analytical lab that's relevant to life detection is the sample analysis at Mars mass spectrometer. And so uh, it measures atmosphere, composition, and the gas evolved when you heat up a rock sample. Now here's how a general description of mass spectrometry working. So you have gas that goes into the ion source, um, which gets ionized. And then each of these charged particles gets separated and fragmented into molecular fragments. Uh, something, some stuff that we found, uh, we found complex organic molecules on Mars in three and a half billion year old rocks. Now these are not life itself, but it's evidence of organic chemistry, which had to be present uh, if life was ever to exist on Mars. Uh, we've also found fixed nitrogen, uh, the same form that you find in, fertili in fertilizer. And this could be incorporated into important biomolecules like proteins and DNA, or used to grow potatoes like Matt Damon did in Martian. We've also measured methane on Mars um, that seasonally varies. And so this could be from biology or geology, we don't know. But on Earth, most methane is biological and shows the same type of fluctuation. So it's very interesting. Now, Mars 2020 Perseverance that just landed um, has the same platform as Curiosity, a different arsenal of, of um, instruments, and some tech demos like the Mars helicopter and the ability to take sample cores. It also has uh, the instrument called Sherlock on the arm. Now, this is its main instrument that will do life detection. It will look for different classes of organics and minerals and how these vary over space. It's on the arm. It doesn't require a sample to be destroyed, and it will help identify samples that would be interesting to core. And this is really the innovation, is this uh, strategy where it can go to a site, take a core, and then deposit it uh, back at a location to be picked up later by a future rover that will then send it back to Earth to be analyzed. So ExoMars, which is the third rover um, and will be launched in 2022, has all of these things. It has a mass spectrometer, it has um, infrared spectroscopy for texture and structure, and it has this Raman spectroscopy to get spatial uh, variation and composition. It also has a two meter drill. And this is important because uh, two meters down, you get below the harsh radiation environment of the surface. You allow um, organics to be uh, preserved and even potentially life. Um, so our best chance at finding life, many people think, is gonna be the return of these samples that were collected by Perseverance. In the future, another rover will come, pick these up, 
and launch them back on an ascent vehicle. Um, and then we'll have the, the samples in a lab with all sorts of sophisticated instrumentation that we can't fly into space. And we'll be able to really analyze them to the best of our abilities and look for these biosignatures. And that's it. A whole lot of information in a, in a short, <laughs> short package. That was terrific. Right. Thank you, Jen. Um, Tony, did you want to take the questions again? Sure. Uh, I'm not seeing any <laughs> hands yet. How about this? How uh, are you guys sick of hearing David Bowie? <laughs> never, never. We love David Bowie. <laughs> okay. That's the right answer. Uh, Renata. <laughs> That's me again. Uh, oh, again. Fantastic presentation. Thank you. Uh, so I wanted to ask about, um, so for the next rover, I know we're still, everybody's really excited about the current rover and it's amazing, but for the next rover, what are you most excited about the potential to learn from that? So I think the next rover, the fact that it has this drill is just huge um, because there, this uh, galactic, galactic cosmic rays really just do a number on the surface. And for Curiosity to have found um, organics, you know, even traces of organics in these three and a half billion year old rocks is amazing. So if we imagine that they could be so much better preserved when you get, you know, two meters below the surface. Um, we also, you know, we have, we know a lot about the surface of Mars. Um, we know a little bit about the sur subsurface, at least structurally through InSight, which is uh, uh, the seismometer. Uh, it's a lander with a seismometer, but we don't know anything below, you know, the first couple of, of inches. And um, you can tell when you drill into the surface that there's just even a huge color change, even just getting a, a couple inches down. So that getting beyond that surface environment, I mean, if there is, a lot of people believe that if there is life on Mars, it will be in the subsurface because if it was ever on the surface, um, it may have sort of gone underground because that is where that that's where things would be more habitable. I mean, you know, there could be there could be subsurface water potentially. Um, there's definitely it's protected from radiation and oxidants. So um, that's to me the most exciting aspect. Uh, Connor, did you have a question? I did. Um, I'll be quick because I got lots of chances to ask Jen questions. But <laughs> um, the the 2022 rover. So the big difference that I see in that, uh, as well as the instrumentation, is the fact that it's solar powered. Um, the European one. Good point. And whereas Perseverance and Curiosity are nuclear powered cars. Um, how does that impact the ability to do science and like the duty cycle and things like that? Does it have to take a lot of rest breaks to recharge, or is it so? Just it better not because it's a much shorter mission. Um, you know, it's a mission that's supposed to be, I, I think it's a month or three. Um, I don't work on that mission, but it's, it's not, you know, like curiosity or perseverance, which are year long missions. So, um, you know, they, I, I suspect, uh, I suspect that of course, recharging will be slower. Um, and, you know, perhaps they sort of do a lot of their difficult things at the beginning. Um, and then maybe have a, a subset of, of activities further on in the mission, which is operationally interesting because it took us, it took us just a month to run SAM, you know, on, on Mars when we first landed. There's so much you have to do to check out, especially when you have so many instruments. Um, so we really used, like, Curiosity has been there almost 10 years and we've really used all that time. So, um, so the energy wow. is an issue. And to me, it's just mind blowing. That's going to be such a short mission. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. I, I never realized it was going to be like a one to three month mission. It's You're supposed used to, to be, I have to see exactly how long it's supposed to be, but it's, it's much shorter. It's on the order of months and not years. So a lot of driving and drilling and everything has to happen like in a really compressed time frame. Yes. And it probably won't go very far. Awesome. So that takes time. Kenji? Um, when you said uh, the cosmic rays, I think you, you mentioned, um, it, is, I've heard that Mars doesn't have a magnetic field. Is that why that's such an issue? And, or are there other issues like just related to the lack of atmosphere or, or less atmosphere? Well, the, the lack of atmosphere is related to the lack of magnetic field, which in turn 
um, is related to uh, having no protection from the cosmic rays. So yeah, it's all linked. And um, it's just, it's a really harsh environment. And um, it's something, obviously that's a concern for humans on Mars, but it's also a concern just for organic molecules. I mean, it's just, it's so destructive. So, so you know, that, and that, that informs our life detection strategy. We don't build instruments to look for DNA, like intact DNA on Mars, because you wouldn't find it. We build it to look at, at those more, the smaller organic subunits, because that's more likely what you'd find. But theoretically, if you can drill down, you could find intact DNA if it had existed? Theoretically, um, but you would also imagine that along with that, there would be, uh, even if we can't measure an intact DNA, there would be smaller things that we could measure uh, with mass, mass spectrometry. Right. Thanks. Good questions, by the way. Uh, James. Hi, Jen. Thanks for talking. Um, the idea of drilling down below the surface to collect a core, you know, below the radioactive below the radiation, and then putting it like on a pickup pad, doesn't leaving it on that pickup pad for a future mission sort of destroy the point? Um, or how, how does the, the pickup site protect the, the drilled core from the surface radiation while it's waiting? Right, I mean, that's a, that is a good point. So the, the, the mission in which we are taking cores is not the same as the one that we're going deep, but it's still a good point because we will be taking cores from, you know, maybe a couple centimeters, a couple inches long, and they will be exposed to the surface. Um, so that's, I mean, that's, that is a good point. There's also, I, I believe in the body of the rover, there is some, um, there is some protection. Um, and I'd have to sort of look a little bit in, look a little bit more into that, um, because you're absolutely right. Like if, if what we're looking for in a return sample is organic matter, et cetera, you, if you sort of let it sit on the surface of Mars. I mean, the one good thing is it's, it is hermetically sealed in these, in these tubes. Um, and there's, I know there's been a lot of focus uh, on temperature control and sort of material science in terms of what you encapsulate that in so that you, know, you can sort of at least control the temperature of that. But that's a really good question. Uh, we'll go to Sarah and then Chris. Hi, yeah. uh, I was wondering, how do you pick the location on Mars that you land on and sample in, especially given that these are the samples that we're going to get to bring back to Earth for the next 10 or 20 years? So that's a great question. Um, and it was like, in a talk like this, it's so hard to get into to those details, but it's, it's a big deal. There are landing site workshops and scientists come, um, you know, they all have their pet site um, that they that they are advocating for. And there's a lot of different sites. Uh, and there's different sites that access different times on Mars as well. Um, Curiosity is at Gale Crater and I was part of that, that process. And there were it maybe a two or three year timeline of meetings uh, and down selecting um, and sort of getting people, you know, lobbying. It's basically lobbying for your site. Um, and you wanna go somewhere where there is, that there was evidence of liquid water in the past so that you have sediments. Uh, sediments are good places to um, bury organics um, and preserve them. And uh, for example, at Gale Crater, you have, uh, you have three and a half billion year old sediments, which interestingly, three and a half billion years ago is when we believe life really started and took hold on Earth. So the idea being that we're going to a place on Mars that, that has been, on Earth, there's really no three and a half billion year old rocks because of plate tectonics. But on Mars, we have those. Um, we're also accessing a place where we think that there's a global climate change because we see a bunch of clays. And then on top of that, a bunch of sulfates. Um, so all of that is really important. And uh, different people have different thoughts on where is the best place to go. So it's, it's, it's tough. <laughs> and there's a lot of you know, arguing about it. Um, and uh, Jezero Crater, which is where Perseverance is going, has carbonates, which is which Gale Crater doesn't at least have a whole lot of them. So it represents a completely different kind of space. So it's exciting to go to these different places and, and know that you know, we're going to get something different. The surface of Mars is not all the same by any means. And uh, I think this is the last question we have time for, Chris. 
Yeah, uh, an observation, radiation shielding is statistical, at least for some kinds of particles. So something a couple inches deep for 4 billion years will absorb more radiation than being on the surface for two years or even two decades. Uh, and the question, if we did discover evidence that life had ever been on Mars, uh, do you think that would affect policy of allowing humans to land on Mars? I mean, that's a, that's a great question. Um, because humans going to Mars has very little to do with science. Um, and the people who want to go will want to go either way and don't always care whether uh, the presence of humans will contaminate. Um, I think, you know, if there is life detected, it does become more immediate um, because it's there. I mean, if it's not detected, we still want to make sure that uh, we are able to detect it and separate it from our own contamination. But um, I think, you know, I think that, I think it would have an impact, but then the sort of cynic in me says, well, the people who want to go anyway are going to, to go and, you know, a space, uh, space is, you know, still the wild west. Um, and commercial entities that have different uh, sort of rules than, than, for example, NASA or government entities. Um, and then on sort of the, the depth, yeah, for sure, like that couple of first inches, um, everything's going to be irradiated. And that's why the, the MoMA or the ExoMars drill was initially supposed to be deeper than, it was supposed to be like three meters or deeper. And now it's to, down to two meters just because of technological challenges. So we're still hoping that getting two meters down, we will get below some of that, uh, those radiation effects. Thanks. Thank you. So um, it looks like there's so many questions. We, we definitely keep going for a while. Um, but what we're going to do is, even though we're just a little bit behind schedule, we're going to take like a five minute break just to allow people to get up and um, stretch their stretch their legs or um, take a quick bio break or get a glass of water or whatever. Um, and then let's say we resume um, in about five minutes time. So that's um, about 52 minutes past the hour or so. And we'll have our third speaker who'll be uh, Juliana. Thank you, Jen.